Hitting start record. We're now recording. So, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning uh, to our contingent from West Virginia uh, and in the United States. Um, welcome to our 10th Roses talk, Roses uh, online seminar, Reading Online Sport Economics Seminars. Delighted to have Brad Humphreys from the University of West Virginia presenting today. He's going to present uh, a very timely paper indeed. Do sporting events amplify influenza transmission, causal evidence from US professional team sports. Uh, Brad's got a, a number of co-authors who are on the call as well, um, so they will be uh, in the chat room. Uh, and so if you have uh, questions you want to ask, please do uh, head there. Um, please keep your microphones on mute. Brad will talk for um, essentially as long as he wants to. He's got, he's got as much as an hour, uh, Brad, and then um, after that we'll have a Q&A session. I'm aware that um, some folk have been unable to use the chat function. If you're in that category, then uh, please feel free to drop me an email with questions that you've got and I can ask them at the end that way. Um, but without any uh, further ado, I'll hand over to you, Brad. Take it away. Thanks, James, and uh, thanks so much for setting this up. Uh, is that good? Do I have my slides up? Yep, perfect. All right, well, um, so as you can see, this uh, this paper is about, or this project is about trying to understand how the staging and holding of, of sporting events might affect uh, influenza transmission. Now I've got a, we have a big research team here. Uh, Alex Cardazzi is a PhD student here in the Econ Department, WVU. Uh, Jane Riseski, my uh, colleague and spouse and longtime collaborator. Uh, Brian Serbing at the University of Alberta, who's not with us this morning because it's even earlier there than it is here and uh, Nick Watanabe uh, at the University of South Carolina. So the idea here is um, that we're looking for, a, the big idea is we're looking for a clean difference in differences experiment that will somehow help us to understand uh, what the, the implications on, on local public health might be when we start staging games again. So, uh, and as you can tell from my background, background photos here, uh, obviously we're not going to work this out completely using current data because we just don't know about what's going on there. But, you know, we've been through flu pandemics before, and obviously, you know, social distancing like, like masks was important in the past, as you can see from that boxing ma match that looks like it must have been on a, a ship during World War I, I believe. Uh, so, we have a pretty good data source for influenza mortality in the United States and cities, and we're going to exploit that to try to understand this. Um, okay, so in terms of motivation, actually, the things that that really got us thinking about this uh, this research project first was this article that uh, that Nick or someone pointed out about what happened in in Bergamo in Italy, where there was this. Champions League match between Atalanta and um, Valencia down in Milan. And it was just before the, uh, the outbreak started there and before things got really bad in Bergamo. And the mayor of Bergamo certainly thought that uh, people going down there and attending that match might have something to do with the terrible uh, on the ground outcomes in Bergamo that happened after that. And then we also found an interesting uh, article that, that speculated that another Champions League match between uh, Atletico and, and Liverpool might have uh, enhanced the transmission and uh, mortality from COVID-19 in, uh, in, uh, in Liverpool. So there's some anecdotal evidence that holding sporting events might have some impact on the uh, spread and transmission of, um, of uh, flu. Our, our other motivation here is there there is some literature it's not particularly big but there is some literature suggesting that uh, in in other settings that that sporting events um, might affect not only the transmission of flu in cities but might also affect mortality from flu and it's this paper by Stoker et al which came out in the American Journal of Health Economics in 2016 now they they look at uh, and I'll have more to say about this paper in just a minute but they basically look at NFL teams participating in the postseason 
and how that postseason participation by teams uh, might lead to higher influence and mortality rates in those cities where that are home to those teams. Now, yeah, I'll just hold off and, and talk about that that paper in a, in a few minutes. So the context for this, of course, we all know, uh, almost except for Belarus and a couple of other player places, uh, nearly every sports league shut down play after this after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and and certainly from news reports, there is some evidence, anecdotal evidence, that sporting events increase uh, transmission. But we're now in a position where a lot of other leagues have already restarted, most of them without fans, and many other leagues are still discussing and seem to be, in the next month or two, going to be restarting play. It's unclear uh, whether that'll be with fans or not. Now, we really don't know much about, I think, about the role of attending sporting events or watching sporting events with a bunch of uh, friends and other fans, uh, the role that that plays in, in flu transmission or flu mortality. But I think we need to know more about that to, to inform these reopening decisions that that um, leagues are, are currently pondering or have already uh, undertaken. There There is an, a small epidemiological literature on sporting events and uh, and and flu transmission. For example, there's a paper that shows that among athletes of the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, that there was uh, enhanced transmission of the of the standard seasonal influenza that was circulating at that time. And then there's also uh, a literature in the epidemiology about how mass attendance events like the Hodge or music festivals uh, increase the transmission of lots of airborne viruses like flu, but also you know, measles and uh, and other viruses that are trans transmitted uh, through the air. And we also know from the scientific literature, the medical literature, that the transmission mechanisms for the standard seasonal influenza, which is circulating around the world all the time, are quite similar to the way that uh, the COVID-19 virus is uh, is transmitted. So, as Dennis has already accused me of, I'm not uh, I'm not um, trying to be an epidemiologist here, but I, we are contributing to what I think is a, is a small, but but probably be growing after uh, our current times, literature on the economic determinants of flu transmission or flu mortality. And uh, that's economics and, and not uh, epidemiology, I think, because we're talking about how economic events can uh, have some impact on, uh, on the transmission and, and deadliness of flu. So the three papers in economics that I've identified, the first, again, is this Stoker et al., American Journal of Health Economics 2016 paper. So their, their outcome variable is annual flu mortality, and uh, they actually have county-level data over the period 1974 to 2009 on, on mortality, which is the number of deaths per 100,000 residents in these counties. And uh, their identification process is they know postseason appearances by NFL teams. And they they find a, a causal effect of participating in the po NFL postseason in a very particular way on flu mortality in these counties that are home to NFL teams. Now, the, the identification issue I wonder about in this paper is it's a very it's success of the NFL team. It's not just playing games, but you've got to have a successful team. And it's a very specific form of success. It's only these cities that are home to M NFL teams who make it to the Super Bowl. And the increased mortality is not in the Super Bowl host city. It's in the it's in the counties that are host to the teams. So now, I don't know. I, I wonder about that identification because that team success is actually going on in the regular season. If you're going to have an NFL team that's going to have a run up to a Super Bowl appearance, appearance, it's probably quite clear at the end of the regular season that your team's going to be successful. And whatever the underlying mechanism is, it seems to me might operate equally uh, in the in those cities in the at the end of the regular season as it would in the postseason. I'll have a little bit more to say about the timing of that in just a minute. Then there's this pretty interesting ADA paper, which was in QJE. Uh, the ADA paper is about virus transmission, and he doesn't just look at flu. He also looks at um, 
chicken pox, and he looks at uh, these sort of noroviruses that cause gastrointestinal problems. And he looks at their transmission in France over the period 1940 to 2010. Now, this is a more epidemiological paper than, uh, than what we're doing or what the Stoker paper does. Uh, he has incidents, not mortality, but he has incidents of these uh, uh, cases of these viruses by department in France. And he's really trying to model transmission. And he's also trying to, to understand the spatial dimensions of transmission. And his identification process uh, involves the the presence of transit strikes and school closures in France. Uh, but he's got a, he specified a very complicated, almost epidemiological um, model that has uh, spatial spillovers and temporal lags of, uh, of incidents. Um, and then there's this Markowitz paper that's a, an MBER working paper that's been kicking around forever. Uh, it's probably 10 years old, I think now, and still unpublished that uses US state level flu incidents over 2010 to 2016 and their identification works off of the state unemployment rate. So their I idea is that there would be workplace transmission of uh, the standard seasonal influenza and, and uh, unemployment rates being higher would mean fewer people were at work and less room for the transmission of that flu. So what we're gonna do here is uh, like the Stoker paper, we're going to analyze weekly flu mortality, and it's from a, a CDC data source, which I'll talk in detail about in a minute. But it basically has information on weekly flu mortality in 122 different U.S. cities over a very long period, 1962 to 2016. And our idea is, we're again, we're looking for a clean diff and di difference and differences experiment based on the uh, new NBA, NHL, NFL, MLB teams entering cities. And uh, so that our idea is that new teams entering these cities works a lot like turning the games back on uh, in sports leagues around the world right now. That's as close as an experiment as I think we can get. And then our, our sort of bottom line result is these cities that got new teams in these professional sports leagues in North America experienced increases in weekly flu mortality between about 10 or 11 percent and about 40 percent. And the effect and the impact varies by sport. So we do find that that uh, professional sporting events and holding those events has an important impact on uh, on flu mortality and presumably the underlying mechanism is flu transmission. So I just want to talk about our data sources first because that's uh, that's important. This is an, a purely empirical exercise. So the the most important data source that we're working on here is this the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S. It's called the 122 Cities Mortality Reporting System, or CMRS. So this is weak. Again, health systems in these cities um, report deaths from either influenza or that were recorded in the death certificates as either from influenza or pneumonia in a very large number of cities over this really long time period. Uh, now, the, the report, there's some limitations to this, to this data set. First, the reporting is is voluntary, unlike some other CDC data sets on, on uh, flu incidents or mortality. So that means that you know there are periods when some cities have just chosen not to continue to report their data, and that pairs our sample down some. Um, we're going to analyze, and our, our unit of uh, temporal analysis then is weekly um, flu mortality over the entire flu season. So we think that that has some strengths, which is first, we don't really have to worry about modeling the transmission or the, the, the distributed lag model uh, that would fully specify the relationship between week to week outcomes that might drive transmission. And then, you know, it, because there's some lag between when you get the flu and somebody actually dies from the flu. So we're going to we're going to exploit that week to week variation, but we've just got a diff and diff specification, which is turn the switch on games, turn the switch off. Another important thing to realize here is our spatial unit of analysis is a city. That's an incorporated place or some political entity. You know, it's not a county. It's not an MSA. It's a it's a city. So, for example, Dennis in Baltimore, 
uh, it would not be Baltimore County, it would be for Baltimore City. Or um, in St. Louis, it would be for only the city of St. Louis and not any of the outlying uh, suburban areas. So it's a it's a it's a relatively restricted um, spatial unit of observation, and that's going to lead us to again pare the sample down some. I'll talk more about that. Just to in terms of this voluntary business, um, the notable cities that would have professional sports teams where we just don't have any data at all: Orlando, Green Bay, Oklahoma City, Anaheim, uh, California, and Raleigh, North Carolina, which is home of an NHL team, the Hurricanes. So we need to calculate or estimate mortality. So we need city population. We can go into the census in the US <clears throat> at census years, 1960 to 2010. And then after 2010, we can use the American Community Survey for the very end of our sample and get annual estimates of population by cities. And then following what Otta does in his paper, we just interpolate uh, annual population in these inter years uh, to come up with a, a, a a variable which shows more variation in population than just at the sensual uh, intervals. We've got this sports team location data that uh, I've been collecting, a lot of us have been collecting for a long time. They just come from media reports, league websites. Basically what this tells us is the exact date in which you know teams started to play and hold games in these cities. And then it's also clear from the medical literature that climatic conditions affect flu transmission and mortality. So we have weather data in terms of temperature and uh, participate precipitation for these cities and that varies at the weekly level, the same frequency as our as our flu mortality data. So that's those are the data sets we've we've put together uh, since we started this project in late March. So uh, uh, just a few issues in terms of data that we have to deal with because we observe flu mortality at the city level and not the county or MSA level. Uh, we have combined city level data in a few cases. That is Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas, Minneapolis and St. Paul and Minnesota, Boston and Cambridge and Massachusetts and, and Tampa and St. Petersburg and Florida. These are all cities that are that are contiguous and be, and are home to professional sports teams. So. Um, I, we can't think of a good reason why we should separate out, for example, Minneapolis and St. Paul as separate areas without trying to somehow model the spatial transmission or the spatial patterns in mortality there. And that seems like something we don't want to do because it's epidemiology. So we're just going to add those up. And then we've also dropped a lot of large cities. So if the cities, for example, in the Los Angeles metropolitan area that are in the data include the city of Los Angeles, uh, the city of Long Beach, the city of Glendale, the city of Pasadena. These are not quite contiguous and the city of Los Angeles has a very odd shape. And uh, since that, you know, it, it's unclear how many people who live in Glendale are attending Los Angeles Lakers games or anything like that. And, and that sort of transmission mechanism, uh, rather than undertake a full Otta style spatial uh, interaction model, we're just gonna drop these for now, these cities, uh, from the uh, from the sample, and then Philadelphia has been dropped, and Camden, New Jersey is right across the the river from Philadelphia because Philadelphia doesn't have a report a full set of flu mortality throughout the sample period. And these these cities in northern New Jersey, which are very close to New York City, we've just dropped those as well. Uh, Chicago has data. We've dropped Chicago because basically there's no variation. In in uh, in professional sports teams over our sample period in Chicago, Chicago had two baseball teams, an NFL team, an NHL team, and except for a very short amount of time, an NBA team for the entire sample period. So it's just not contributing variation uh, to what we're really after, and we're going to drop that out. The same for New York City, and also uh, New York City presents some other problems because um, while the football teams don't actually play physically in New York City. They play in northern New Jersey, and that probably complicates, again, uh, the dynamics of transmission, which we want to try to abstract from and only focus on this question we think we can answer reasonably, which is when you turn the games on, what happens? Uh, Fort Worth is is missing a bunch of data. Uh, that's in the Met Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. We're going to keep Dallas, and uh, we're going to treat all the teams as if they were in Dallas. That's technically not the case, um, but but I think that's not too bad an assumption. 
Okay, so let's talk about uh, the, the, the transmission mechanism or how sporting events might influence uh, the transmission of, of standard seasonal influenza and mortality from that. So influenza transmission is an infected to uninfected transmission process. That is, people infected with the virus shed virus via these airborne particles. That is, you cough or sneeze, sneeze or cheer or uh, do something like that. Uninfected uh, people come into contact with, with this shed virus either by just directly coming into contact with the airborne particles or the person who's infected expels that virus onto some surfaces like door handles, seats, uh, railings, things like that. And then the un uninfected person touches those surfaces with their hands and transmits the virus uh, from their hands to their face and into their body and then they become infected. So the key here is that proximity is an important factor in this transmission process, uh, either directly or indirectly. And obviously, as we can tell from uh, the anecdotal evidence out there about the Champions League matches or, or the Stoker paper, fans attending these sporting events are potentially exposed to both these types of transmission mechanisms. All right, there's lots of shouting, cheering, high-fiving, hugging, things like that in the stands at, at games and matches. And there's also, you know, just close proximity where somebody right behind you could sneeze on on uh, on you, something like that. And there's many commonly touched surfaces in uh, restrooms, at concession stands, uh, potentially getting into the venue and things like that. There's a lot of opportunities there. Now, Soaker also raises the possibility that there's another related transmission mechanism uh, from sports, that is, if you don't go to the game, many fans might gather in bars or homes just to watch games on, on television. And all those transmission mechanisms uh, potentially could also expose people to uh, who are uninfected to become infected with the virus at, at those venues. And and that could certainly, you know, Stoker posit that that's, that's one of the reasons why you have to get to the Super Bowl in order to be uh find an effect, it's because they, they posit that people in these cities are getting together to watch the Super Bowl, and that's an important uh, transmission vector. Now, it's also important to recognize that, that things like for, this, for the regular uh, seasonal flu, which is circulating around the world all the time, uh, it's quite different from COVID-19 because we have both uh, some herd immunity and vaccination for that that limits the transmission of, of the seasonal flu, but that that uh, immunity is not permanent. There's what's called genetic drift in the flu virus, which uh, reduces both the uh, ability of herd immunity, immunity and vaccination to limit transmission. So that's why the 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 regular seasonal flu does not go away completely, because there there's always ch slight changes in the virus that makes it uh, that makes it more um, that makes the herd immunity or the vaccination immunity uh, not work after one or two years. And the medical literature, the epidemiological literature, typically assumes that after two or three years, transmission will, uh, that herd immunity will not work that well. So again, we're looking, our outcome is mortality, uh, the mortality rate, but it, it's also important to recognize that mortality does depend on transmission. So the idea is that wider transmission of the flu in a city or an area means that more people, more vulnerable people were exposed to the to the virus who wouldn't have got it uh, absent this enhanced transmission from something. And there's also difference in mortality that that depends on the virulence of the particular flu strain that's circulating. We control for that in our empirical work by going into the ep epidemiological literature and, and uh, just coming up with indicator variables for the different uh, for the different strains that are circulating in each year, and those vary from year to year. Okay. So our empirical approach, again, is a difference in differences approach. Our dependent variable is, is weekly influence and mortality per 100,000 residents in, uh, in city C in time period T. And then we have, as usual, we're going to exploit the timing of the arrival of new professional sports teams in U.S. cities. So we've got an indicator function there, I, uh, which depends on whether or not games are going on. If any games played in City C between week WS and week WE, and uh, that's our that's our diff and diff uh, indicator variable. 
And of course, delta then is our parameter of interest. If we've got things specified correctly, that'll, that'll tell us something about the causal impact of holding games in these cities on flu mortality. We've got a vector of time varying city specific factors C. Uh, and then we have basically every fixed effect known to man that we could put in to this model for a uh, week of the flu season, month, season, city specific uh, um, fixed effects and, and all of those sort of fixed effects to control for other unobservable invariant uh, characteristics that might affect, affect flu uh, mortality. So, I also want to point out that for diff and diff to work, you know, we think about many diff and diff uh, um, papers. They're they're examining some policy which might be put in place because of the very outcome uh, variable that they're trying to measure. For example, a lot of people right now are trying to use diff and diff to understand social distancing and how much social distancing takes place. Um, but those policies are probably put in place to affect. Uh, social dif differencing to begin with, so you really have to worry about the endogeneity of the policy. In this case, our outcome variable is uh, flu mortality, but our, our diff and diff is when games start. It, it seems really implausible to us that the timing of entry of a team into a city in the United States has anything to do whatsoever with the uh, changes in, in uh, time varying unobservable factors that affect uh, flu mortality. I don't think that a team owner who decides to move his team from one city to another is saying, well, it's because that other city is going to have really good uh, public health that keeps flu from, from uh, transmitting in that city. Uh, in our sample, I'll, I'll remind everybody that new teams enter cities either as a result of league expansion in North America, and that league expansion is primarily to deter the formation of rival leagues, which actually happens in our in our sample period, or teams move from one city to another in order to get a better facility deal and a nicer uh, publicly subsidized facility. There's, there's little reason, I think, to believe that those factors that lead to those moves are correlated in any sense with uh, unobservable factors affecting flu mortality in those specific cities. So we're going to assume that, that that's basically random assignment of teams to cities in terms of our outcome variable plausibly exogenous to any unobservable factors here. And so the idea here in our uh, diff and diff is uh, our treated cities get one new team and the control cities that we're going to look at have no professional sports team over the entire period. So our identification process. Again, we're going to exploit the presence of, of NFL, NBA, NHL, NHL, MLB teams across cities and over time. Those are due to economic factors. Uh, there's substantial variation that I'm going to show you in the next slide in, in the presence of those things. But again, the, the, the idea here is treated cities get exactly one new pro team at some point in this sample, 1962 to 2016. The control cities never have a pro team uh, at any time. And I just want to point out that we do have overlap between, so some people might say, well, those control cities are probably much, much smaller than, than the treated cities, but that's actually not the case. Uh, we, our largest control cities are larger than some of our smaller treated cities. So El Paso, Albuquerque, Tucson, Fresno, Omaha are all uh, pretty large. Some of the smallest treated cities, Salt Lake, St. Louis, Atlanta, just the city of Atlanta. Again, the Atlanta MSA is big, but we only have data for the, the city of Atlanta. That's not even Fulton County. And uh, it, the city there is, is not that large in, in Portland. So it, it's not like we've got completely... Uh, separate control and treated city groups in terms of population. Oh, so here's the variation that we have to work with. Uh, this is a pretty complicated picture, but I think it, it, it's important for our identification. So up here in the left, this is basically almost every city that has an NBA team over our sample period, sample period 62 to 2016. Uh, in a city like Boston, the Celtics have been in Boston for the entire sample period. So that uh, that black bar there says there's the that that's a treated city for the entire period. That's not providing us with any diff and diff time variation. Uh, but Atlanta does because it, um, Atlanta didn't get the Hawks until the late 60s. So there's a period uh, of when Atlanta is not treated and then treated. Now there's also a lot of cities where 
Uh, for example, San Diego has a, that's an ABA team, and then they leave, and they had the Clippers for a while, and then the, the NBA team Clippers moved to Los Angeles. So untreated, treated, untreated, treated. We we don't we don't quite know how to handle that yet. We've been we've been thinking about how to how to handle that in our different diff framework, and it's not clear to us then you know what what the the uh, how to treat this post um, period. So instead, what we're going to focus on, you can see the other thing is quite a bit of variation. This is the NBA down here in the bottom right. That's Major League Baseball. Most of these baseball teams that are that are in uh, the sample are in the sample for the entire period. That's because Major League Baseball um, started very early in the 19th century and has been uh, uh, professionalized for a long time. Um, a lot more variation in the uh, NHL that's up here. And then this is the NFL uh, as well. So what we've decided to focus on is to pull again, pull out only these treated cities that get a new team and keep that team for the rest of the sample period uh, during our sample period. So that leaves us with these treated teams, uh, cities. And you can see the, that we have a lot more of them again in the NBA, but there's still pretty good temporal variation in, in when the treatment starts. You know, Memphis doesn't get a team until, until 2000. Some of these are in the 60s, some are in the 70s. Here's the treated cities in the NHL. They're pretty much later because the NHL is again, uh, was expanding to try to deter rival league formation after their unsuccessful attempt at that in the 70s. Uh, Major League Baseball has not expanded much. We have relatively few treated cities there. And then this is the NFL, and we get pretty good variation in the NFL, I think, um, uh, over time. But again, Tampa, 1976, they get the uh, Buccaneers. And untreated, and then Tampa is treated there from 1976 throughout the rest of the sample period. That's our that's our basic temporal within city diff and diff identification. Now, here's another important thing to uh, in terms of our identification. Again, there's a lot going on in this in this picture, but let's walk through it. So this tells us something about the since our our outcome variable is weekly flu mortality. This tells us something about how weekly flu mortality changes on average over the flu season. So the top grade, this, these, these two jagged lines, that's the average flu mortality for each week in the flu season. The horizontal axis here is time, it's weeks, but it's weeks starting in the first full week of July and going through to the last full week of June. So, and then these, these two um, vertical lines are the, the quote unquote flu season. The CDC doesn't specifically define the flu season, but it just says generally it, it runs from early October until late May. So, you know, flu mortality rates and incidence rates are quite low in the summertime. We know this because there's a seasonal component to the flu season. Start of the flu season, uh, flu mortality starts to rise in both treated and untreated cities. Really sparks spikes here. That's January. That's sort of the heart of the flu season. And then after it peaks, uh, flu mortality generally declines through the rest of the flu season and goes back to relatively low levels again during the early summer months. The gray line is our control cities and the black line are our treated cities. So I think this is good for our identification that these new teams tend to go into cities that have uh, lower flu mortality rates. And that's going to, you know, offset some fears that we might just be finding some sort of positive effect because of general characteristics where new teams go in. And uh, I'd be more concerned about our identification if that was flip-flopped. Um, and there were, and there tended to be higher flu mortality in, in the treated cities than in the control. And then these horizontal lines tell us about the temporal nature of the season in each sport. So, uh, the, the, this is the NBA season from the start of the regular season to the end of the postseason. The NBA season starts slightly after the flu season starts, runs through the heart of flu season, and then extends well beyond the end of what's typically called the flu season, especially in the postseason. The NHL is similar but starts earlier and uh, ends a little bit earlier. The, the NFL season starts well before the start of flu season. It generally starts at the beginning of September, and then – the playoffs, which is the right end of every one of these uh, graphs, is the playoff period. This is what Stoker et al. exploit. That's the postseason. It really happens when the flu season is peaking in, in these cities. 
Uh, and then Major League Baseball, two different Major League Baseball seasons uh, extend into the flu season. So this would be the Major League Baseball postseason from the previous year that typically runs into October this, and just overlaps with the start of flu season. And then the following Major League Baseball season would start, the early regular season games would start just at the end of the same flu season. So the nature of the seasons and when the games are going on differs. So that's going to lead us to estimate these models separately by sport and not pull the models over all of the uh, all of the uh, uh, sports in, at one time. Let's just look at uh, again some summary statistics for the basic variables that are that are varying uh, over time and not the fixed effects here. This is uh, um, mean and standard deviation for each of the sports. Uh, the top top row of each of these um, panels is the control cities. Bottom row is the treated cities. So again, you can see that the flu mortality rate for the NHL, NFL, NBA, and MLB tend to be higher in the control cities than the than the uh, treated cities. The treated cities tend to be bigger. We're going to use pop we're going to control for population in our regression model, so that doesn't matter. Plus, we have a city fixed effects we can fixed effect we can estimate. This population is in hundreds of thousands. So this 0.648 is 648,000 people is the average population over the entire sample period for teams that cities that got a new NHL team. And they're all bigger, quite bigger for NBA teams uh, than, it, than it would be for the control cities. The, the treated cities tend to be warmer and they tend to, to be a little bit rainier. Well, in some cases, not, not in the NBA and not in the in Major League Baseball, but a little bit rainier in terms of the cities got new NHL teams and new NFL teams. And rain and, and humidity have been shown to uh, influence flu transmission in the epidemiological literature. So another identification issue, of course, we're doing diff and diff here. And we wanna we want to be able to recover some causal impact. So for diff and diff to be able to uncover causal impact, we've got to have the parallel trends assumption hold. Uh, that means the time paths of the treated and control groups would have should have been the same absent the treatment, which is the entry of a new team into those cities. And the way people commonly validate uh, the, the parallel trends assumption is by undertaking these um, event study models where you pull the observations across treated and control. We put dummy variables, which pick out the uh, the period before and the period after the treatment starts. And our treatment is staggered here, right? So the treatment doesn't come in all at the same time. The, the temporal variation here shows we have a staggered treatment. So all we do is uh, we just normalize the, the, and we use annual data for this. We normalize the, the uh, treatment period to zero and minus one, minus two, minus three, the three years before treatment occurred, there's the treatment period normalized, and there's the three years after. These are the point estimates on those event study annual dummy variables. These are the 95% confidence intervals. It looks like we're pretty good. There's there's, there's no statistical difference between, um, between weekly flu, uh, annual flu mortality before and after treatment in any of the cities in any of these sports. So I think this, this uh, is usually uh, taken as decent evidence that the parallel trends assumption is going to hold in these cities and that any difference we get in uh, in flu mortality can be attributed to the treatment occurring. So here's our main results. Uh, and this is not the full set of results. It's only the diff and the key diff and diff and parameters of interest and the time varying uh, the parameters and the time varying variables. So just to go through the con the city level controls, um, the the parameter on uh, across all four sports, the parameter on population is negative and significant. Larger cities have lower weekly flu mortality than smaller cities. Other thing held other things held uh, constant could reflect better uh, health care in larger cities. Could reflect a younger population which would be less vulnerable to uh, influenza. Uh, don't know, but the, we've controlled for population and differences in population over time and across cities. Um, warmer cities, cities with higher temperature tend to have uh, lower flu mortality rates for all four of these different sports. And rainier cities tend to have uh, higher flu mortality rates. I think that's in general in keeping with the uh, with the epidemiological evidence that's out there. 
the temperature and, and uh, humidity both play roles in transmission and dust mortality. So here's the, we get these significant effects of uh, our diff and diff parameter. That is a new NHL team uh, coming into a city raises um, weekly flu mortality by 0.227 people per week. Uh, those are all highly significant. I'll talk about clustering of standard errors. These are just robust standard errors uh, in the robustness check. Um, but to put that in percentage terms, here's what it means. So that uh, 0.227 based on the average uh, weekly mortality is a 15% increase in uh, weekly flu mortality in cities that acquired a new NHL team relative to both flu mortality in that city before the NHL team came in and relative to flu mortality in cities with no NHL, no professional sports teams whatsoever. So the percentage changes are smallest for MLB. I think that makes sense because again, the Major League Baseball uh, season is not very, doesn't overlap very much with the flu season. And it's uh, strongest for NBA and, uh, and NHL and uh, slightly more in NHL, the NHL. These seasons, the, the, the season, the sports season overlaps substantially with, uh, with the flu season. And in the case of the NFL, it's the postseason when a lot of interest is there in, in NFL games uh, in January when the flu season is peaking. So that, that tells us that, that it looks like the holding of sporting events has some important uh, influence causes higher flu mortality and probably causes transmission. That's got to be, again, the underlying mechanism. We want to do some, some uh, robustness check. So the closest paper to ours, the Stoker paper, actually uses annual influenza mortality. So we can go ahead and collapse our weekly data down uh, to, get, to get annual influenza mortality. Uh, obviously, we're losing some uh, precision in our estimates because the sample size is just substantially lower once and we also think well this of course is washing out some of the week-to-week uh, -week variation which is important in the transmission pro process and the role that games are playing which we're not going to specifically model but but is still there in the background uh, we lose significance on nba and and uh, mlb we still get significance on uh on the diff and diff parameters for NHL and NFL teams, the magnitude of those are about the same as the, as the implied magnitudes in terms of percentages. Um, of course, they're bigger because annual flu mortality is just the sum of all the weekly flu mortalities through the uh, through the flu season weeks. But so it, we're, that that backs up or that confirms that we're getting similar results, especially we get this NFL effect uh, to what Stoker finds. So. Uh, we can say we can extend Stoker's results to generalize to other sports in, in broader context of just playing games and not postseason appearances. Stoker actually uses uh, their uh, outcome variable is, is influenza mortality among people 65 and older because they use a different data set than we do. Uh, we, we don't know flu deaths, influenza deaths, or pneumonia deaths by age group in our data set. But we do know the total uh, all-cause mortality rates by age groups. So when we estimate this on um, all-cause, where the dependent variable is all-cause mortality, 65 and older, we're still getting an effect of new NHL teams and new NFL teams on all-cause mortality. So I'm going to say that is suggestive that uh, the underlying mechanism is Flu is being transmitted to more, uh, because of the holding of games in these cities, flu is being transmitted to more vulnerable populations and driving up the, the mortality rate. So I'll interpret that as, uh, as, as evidence that, that that's also driven by higher um, flu mortality among 65 and older people. I don't know what's going on in baseball. I think that, you know, so that says getting a new baseball team is going to lower all-cause mortality in the 65 and older uh, um uh, group. I think that's probably because the baseball season just doesn't, we're picking up other factors because the baseball season doesn't overlap with the flu season uh, very well at all. It could also be due to uh, uncontrolled for heterogeneity in, in the care, in the cities that got new baseball teams, which are, could be different. So some other, uh, some other robustness checks. I'm not going to report them here just because of lack of time. I'm almost up with my time here. We do estimate models uh, using the annual data that just contain indicator variables 
when the team in that city made the playoffs um, in that season, in that flu season, that which is sort of like Stoker et al., except you know, remember Stoker et al.'s identification is is based on success in the postseason and not appearances. Uh, we don't get any effect of of uh, of those playoff appearances on on flu mortality rates, the standard seasonal flu mortality rates in those cities. Uh, I don't know if that's a – we just wanted to replicate that to see what we got. Uh, so Stoker et al.'s results also raise the possibility that it's not attendance that's playing the important role here in transmission and, this, and thus increasing mortality, but it's just people getting together to watch to watch games. So the our idea there is more people would get together to watch games when the game when there were away games. So we estimate these weekly models where we actually know the number of home and away games in each week uh, that are played in each city over the entire sample period. We think that that variation should be exogenous to to unobservables of driving flu death because you know that's just the, the variation in that variable is just due to the vagaries of the scheduling of uh, of sports. We don't get any significant effect out of that, uh, but I think that probably reflects our lack of any modeling of the temporal dynamics, the distributed lags of those games, because of the lag between transmission of flu and mortality of flu. Could be weeks, could be a month. Uh, Otto goes through this exercise where he estimates the effect on the week of peak flu deaths of strikes in uh, transportation or school shutdowns in France. We estimate that we don't find any significant effects of the entry of these professional sports teams uh, on the peak. And again, I think that's because the the dynamics of transmission and, and mortality are uh, are different for sports than it would be for school shutdowns or, or transit strikes. Cluster correction, big issue, of course, in diff and diff uh, models. I'll just point to this great paper, I think, that help that informs the way I think about cluster correction, which is the Cameron and Miller Journal of Human Resources 2015 Practitioner's Guide to Cluster Robust Inference. That paper says if a key re regressor, that is a diff and diff regressor, is randomly assigned within clusters or is as good as randomly assigned, then the within cluster correlation of the regressor is likely to be zero. No need to cluster standard errors. I think that case applies to us. I can't imagine that there's systematic correlation between the entry of these teams into cities and uh, unobservable factors that drive flu mortality. Uh, but when we do cluster correct at the city level, we get similar results. It, we lose some significance on the difference and differences parameters in the, uh, in, in the um, NBA and Major League Baseball ca uh, cases, much like what happens when we go from weekly to annual data. So there is some sensitivity there to our choice of uh, cluster correction, but even when we cluster correct at the city level, which some people would argue we should do, we still find evidence that the entry of some professional sports teams into cities causes higher flu mortality in those cities over the over the flu season. So just to sum up where we're at right now, uh, we've developed some evidence that that holding professional sports games causes increases in seasonal flu mortality in a in a sample of U.S. cities in a uh, in a diff and diff context. There's suggestive evidence that, that much of this increased mortality occurs in the population over 65, but uh, given our current data source, we don't uh, have the data to formally test this idea like Stoker et al. do. The likely mechanism again is, is increased transmission, person to person transmission through attendance at games. Uh, and that is, uh, and so we can, we can draw a tentative conclusion there if attending games increases transmission of regular seasonal, seasonal influenza, it certainly is, is much more likely that uh, having in the COVID-19 era, letting fans into games is, is going to lead to these Bergamo type, potentially lead to these Bergamo uh, type incidents where it becomes super spreader events. I think we should, this evidence says that we should be really concerned about, about that when considering what sort of reopening policies that uh, that leagues or the or uh, government might permit. Uh, caution is certainly warranted, especially if you're talking about holding games with fans in the in the stands. Uh, it's also possible that this mechanism that fans gathering to watch games in bars, in, in restaurants, in, in their homes could also increase transmission 
we we did the best we could to try to look at that. We don't find any evidence, but this is probably our data limitations and and uh, and not what's actually going on in terms of the impact. And we think that that would be uh, an important topic for further research is to to try to because you know obviously if we're going to start games again, this is of, of intense policy interest because if people are going to get together in their homes in large groups and not social distance and watch these games, then you might have just as bad an impact on the transmission and mortality of COVID-19 as there would be letting fans in the in the uh, in the in the uh, venues. So I think that's a really important issue for additional research that we have some ideas about how we're going to move forward on that. And that's what I have. Thank you very much, Brad. Really, really interesting talk. Very timely, um, very thorough um, delivery as well. Uh, thank you very, very much. There's been a few questions in the chat room which I'll go through. Uh, uh, various of your uh, co-authors uh, have been uh, have been chipping in as well, so um, you know, they, they, they've answered a few of them. Uh, Jamin uh, asked first of all um, whether results are stronger for teams that play central downtown areas versus suburbs. Yeah, we haven't looked at the. I'm not sure if that got. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that got got answered. We haven't actually uh, exploited the the spatial location of venues within cities over time yet. That's a good that's a good idea because certainly over this very long sample period that we have, you know, we've got the shift of of these uh, arenas and stadiums from downtown to the suburbs and then back, and mm. that's cer certainly something that that we would just need to do a little more data collection on, but should be able to see if that plays a role and if that might also help at getting at whether or not uh, this is due to people attending or just people gathering to be near the, the venues. And that's gonna be much more likely to happen in downtown arenas or stadiums than it is in these stadiums or arenas which are out in the middle of a bunch of parking lots in the suburbs of these cities. We, that's a good idea. We just haven't, we just haven't quantified yet that yet and, uh, and we certainly can. Yeah. Dennis asks, have you done the team departure and labor stoppages as robustness tests? And then I think um, Alex answered that uh, that's on the way and you tried looking at some lockout. We have some preliminary results, Dennis, it does. Uh, so we've got work stoppages and uh, and it, it there is evidence that that work stoppages during work stoppages, transmission ra uh, mortality rates were lower in cities with teams, uh, not across all four sports, but I think we get it in the NFL and uh, in the NHL. And of course, in the NHL, we've got a lot of gr that's where we've got the big variation because the NHL lost for those who who don't know it or recall it, the NHL lost an entire season in 2004, 2005. There was a labor dispute and these labor disputes that, that lead to these stoppages should be plausibly exogenous again to flu mortality uh, factors. So we do have some preliminary e evidence and it, it goes in the right direction. Okay, and then um, Jorge uh, Tova asks, is it worth controlling for the percentage of the population that has been vaccinated? Because in some regions, in some regions, there's a belief that vaccines are bad, anti-vaccines, and so on, uh, and that may have changed over time. Yeah. So um, there's not good systematic data over long periods of time on vaccination rates. Um, we have we have year flu season dummy variables, which is going to control for the overall variation, year-to-year -year variation in in vaccination rates. We can't really estimate. Well, we probably could, but I think it's overfitting the model. To estimate fully interacted uh, city season uh, variables. Um, yeah, I think that uh, if anything, if there's systematic variation in in vaccination rates, and it would not also be vaccination rates, because there's also differences in the effectiveness of the vaccines o across flu seasons. Sometimes the vaccines just don't uh, just don't contain antibodies for the, the prevalent strain that's that's circulating, so there could be that as well. I think that would tend to um, bias our estimated parameters towards zero and uh, the extent that we're, we're not really controlling for that, so I, I don't know if that's a, a huge problem or not. Okay, and Georgios Nabantis says there are studies that show that poor air quality affects the mortality rates of 
influenza. Other studies show that air pollution increases with increasing income. Arguably, team owners choose cities with high income, thus higher air pollution and possibly higher flight flu mortality. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, our, uh, our, our city specific fixed effect is not going to get at that because there's systematic variation over time in income across cities. Um, we could certainly think about, so we have a little bit of a problem matching um, other economic characteristics to our city level data because those are collected at the county or um, metropolitan area level. We, we could use county income or county income per capita uh, as an explanatory variable in this and, and see if our results are, the, uh, are robust to the inclusion of that. Of course, that's not varying week by week. We don't get annual variation, but it's probably worth that as a robustness check to make sure that's not that's not going on. Um, it is it is you know team owners might choose cities with higher income, but they often move you know for reasons that they're getting a better stadium deal in their new city, and it's not clear that that is nece that's necessarily correlated with higher income cities. If you look at some of the patterns of moving, right, the the Charlotte. Um, Hornets move from Charlotte to New Orleans. Charlotte's a pretty high income city. New Orleans is a pretty low income city. Uh, but the the team owner didn't like his arena in Charlotte and liked the arena deal he had in, in uh, New Orleans. So, yeah, I don't know. It, it's probably worth at least uh, thinking about, and we'd be a shorter sample period, but it's probably worth thinking about that as a robustness check, Georgie. And then Jamin also highlights a paper by Andrew Goodman Bacon yeah. on staggering treatments in death and death. Yeah, I, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, it is more complicated and it's worth at least citing and, and thinking about the, the points that he makes about staggered death and death treatment. Yeah, that's, that, we haven't talked about it yet. That needs to be in there, certainly. Thanks. Uh, this is Jane. Also, another point to um, that point. Our control group are cities that never, ever had a team. So we don't have cities moving in and out of the treatment and control. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then Dennis said new teams rarely make the playoffs. So the connection of influence and mortality to NFL postseason is troubling. Uh, in, in our results, Dennis? Brad, it was just the way that you framed it. You you talked about um, the the peak of the flu season occurring um, during the NFL playoffs, and then so your results are purely about the new teams, and new teams don't make the playoffs. So, just I would not bring that up because it's really not relevant. Uh, I don't know. I mean, our switch goes on and stays on forever. The diff and diff switch is permanent. So if all the identification action was coming off that first season, I'd agree with you, but I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, we, if you if we go back and I won't share my screen again, but I mean, the, these treated cities, um, some of those teams enter in the uh, in the 70s, for example, in Tampa, St. Pete. And, uh, and and so the identification is still coming off of the presence of a team in, in Tampa, St. Pete. 15 years. I, maybe that's not a good example. It's a terrible Yeah, you just, <laughs> you made it even worse, right? Because you just <laughs> said this new team moved in and 20 years later, there's now a flu epidemic. That's <laughs> well, Charlotte, Charlotte went to the Super Bowl though, not long after. And so, yeah, but the number of times that, that a team, uh, the length of time between entry and making the playoffs in any of the sports tends to be pretty long. So uh, it's just I, a matter I agree. of, I but I, I mean, I made that comment because I view that that's a Stoker problem and not a my paper, this paper problem. That's right. Okay, They're the ones well, that I think are, are I, I, we think that the transmission mechanism is working throughout the regular season and not just in the postseason. Yeah, I would agree with that. And one of the other comments I wanted to make was I wonder if, um, you had a variable that was something like the proportion of the team's games that have been home games up to this point so that it moves from week to week. I know you're getting at the transmission idea there, um, but it also, I don't know, it seems more relevant 
Yeah. Uh, and it also yep. splits, you, you know, you could think about that TV issue. Um, when are they more likely to congregate for home games or for away games? And it would seem away games. Right? Yeah, I agree. That's a anyway. good idea. That's a good idea. And we certainly, I mean, we've got this, uh, we have a data set that, that has the date of every home and away game played through the entire sample period in every sport. It would be easy enough to calculate what the fraction of uh, games up and up until any week in the season are home games and see if that that might that might work better than our just just our uh, weekly number of home and away games. That's a good idea, actually. Okay, and then Jamin says, I think most new NHL teams, at least since the 1990s, are in warm weather cities. Maybe this contributes to lower estimates for NHL. Maybe this isn't true for the whole sample period, though. All right, Jamin, that's a good point. Treated NHL cities. Well, Buffalo is one of our treated cities. They got actually in the in the 70s, the uh, Sabres show up. Columbus is a treated city. I don't believe that's a warm weather city. Certainly there are Dallas, Miami, Nashville, Phoenix, uh, Tampa. Washington's a treated city. Many of them are, but they're in uh, St. Louis would not be a warm weather city either, and it's treated. So uh, I, I don't think it's exclusively um, warm weather cities, but but uh, there are quite a, there are probably more warm we warm weather cities that are that are treated in the NHL than uh, than in any of our other sports, which that's probably worth pointing out, uh, at least for the patterns of of why we get that. Yeah, that's good. I know it's that so it's about the departure because many of the warm weather NHL cities also lost teams in your time period. Yeah, I know, Dennis. I can't figure out what the right what the right treatment, uh, the diff and diff approach is in the, in those departures. I mean, there's obviously a lot of them, but there's not that many, there's actually not that many cities that would be treated if we said, if, if a team departs and you never get another team in that sport, a lot of the cities that, that would have that sort of treatment of the departure would then at some point before the end of the sample, get another team in the same league. And I don't know how to, you know, when do you end the, I guess you end it when the when the new uh, team in that league shows up. But you think about Dallas, I mean, Houston, right? So they've got the Oilers and they start in the 60s. And then in the in the uh, 90s, the Oilers leave for Tennessee and then they get the Texans. So what's the is the treatment period just the seasons between when the Oilers left and the Texas Texans came in? If, if we can work out the details about what exactly the right way to to envision the treatment is there. I think that would be worthwhile doing, but it just, when we started thinking about it more carefully, it just got harder and harder to think about it. And what we want again is a clean diff and diff experiment. And that's just not as clean as new cities. I'm not saying it's not worth doing, but it's it's certainly a harder question. So Stefan asked a question via email, which I'm just gonna go and uh, find says three questions consider alternative alter, uh, consider alternative estimators eg for fantasy score matching two try placebo test and three on cities that lost the team could there be a separate diff and diff as in testing a cure for disease and stefan you can unmute your mic if you want as well yeah so um well certainly i just i just addressed the issue of uh, of Cities that lose teams is just not as not as clean. Uh, I am not a huge fan of propensity score matching as a, as a causal inference technique. I, I think it's probably the the weakest. I don't care what Michael Lechner says. I think it's probably the weakest uh, uh, of the causal inference estimators there might be. I IV. I don't know. We got an instrument that's going to be tough. Um, I. I it would probably be good to, to try to put together a placebo test. Um, I'm not sure exactly along what lines uh, that would be done, but I think that would be that would certainly help to bolster uh, bolster this. Maybe just randomly assign uh, teams uh, based on the the given spatial and and temporal distribution of new team arrivals, and and just make sure that that doesn't turn out to be the same as what we've got. Yeah, that's 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 a good idea, Stephen. I think that, that probably a referee is going to make us do that anyway. So 
Stefan, you're muted if you have any comments. I don't know if you. Yeah, no, uh, that, that 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 makes sense. I, I mean, I think the present propensity score matching is just robustness, right? I mean, whether you like it or not, I, again, Reverie might well just ask you to do it anyway, so you might as well might as well get it done now. It's not exactly costly; it's pretty easy to run, right? So, uh, well, you we've got to have covariates to match on, and we need a in a, in a pretreatment period. I mean, I don't, well, we could match on population, I guess, would be the natural choice. Um, but we don't have a right now. We don't have a wide variety of of you know, economic variables to match on. Um, if, yeah, sure. No. Anyway, no, I, I I think the whole thing's very nice. So I so I like the whole paper. But um, but I it, just things that you you know referees are going to say anyway. So. I know, especially especially if we're thinking about a health journal for this, and they're brutal. <laughs> So George asks, I see in the in the chat, um, policy-wise, is it a valid conclusion to recommend that looking at health indicators, it's better to not have a sports franchise? Uh, I think if you ask me, there there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that not just on on health indicators, but I mean, you know, traffic is worse in cities that have professional sports teams. Uh, air air quality is worse in cities that have professional sports teams. The Stoker paper certainly, you know, and this these results would would say that. Well, I wouldn't say better not to have a, a, a team. I would say better not to to try to attract a team using substantial public subsidies. You know, maybe this implication would be what I said in my journal policy and analysis and management paper recently that we should tax these teams and not subsidize them because that's what economists say we should do when when substantial negative externalities are being generated by some uh, economic activity. So I think it's certainly, I don't know if I'd go as far as 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 to say not to have a team because, I mean, there's obvious uh, intangible benefits that are generated by professional sports teams in cities. And nobody disputes that, but you might want to tax them to, uh, to uh, address this, which I, I think there's a growing body of literature that suggests that. Mm -hmm. Conscious that the <laughs> exactly, Dennis. <laughs> Linda Arch asks you about I uh, think about travel to game type uh, questions. Uh, is there is the data available on how supported the travel to games you know, mass transit systems versus walking or driving? I, I think that that that's going to be a lot more important in a European context than than in the. Uh, U.S. context, because absolutely there's way more travel between games where the travel distances are shorter. I, yeah. Yeah, the, you've got to travel by, nope, it's difficult to drive outside the, the eastern quarter of the United States to go to an away game. You'd have to fly. There's not good uh, flight data over the sample period, and you can't even really know uh, why people are traveling. Uh, if I was, if I had, I, if I replicated this in a European setting and had this sort of data in a European setting, I'd absolutely want to control for distance and travel. I mean, the the closest thing we could easily do, but it's not going to make a difference. We could we could control for the distance between pairs of teams that are playing in any week, but that's good. That's fixed. That's going that you know that's a, a fixed effect is going to pick that up. So we're at minimum, hopefully, we're controlling for that in that sense. But I, I think that travel is important, and especially going to be important in Europe for the wonder, question of whether or not fans are allowed. I wonder though whether Linda's talking about uh, fans going to a home game. So whether oh. they go in a car. Oh, that wasn't clear to me. Okay, okay. public transport. Uh, well, pff, you know, in the U.S., we have almost no public transit. <laughs> 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 you can't. Oh, yeah, I can. Uh, I think I can count on one hand the number of, of uh, stadiums and arenas that you could actually get to uh, reasonably using public transit. So, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm okay. uh, then Zach, phone is another qu another question by email. And Zach, if you want to unmute, you're welcome to. But he says, um, try a robustness uh, check where control cities are cities that don't have a new entrant over the sample period. More likely to be similar along unobserved characteristics to the truth of cities than cities that have never had a team. From the variation pictures, it looks like limiting to 1970 or 1975 onwards to have enough control cities. Yeah, that's worth. That's a good point. 
That's uh, that's certainly worth thinking about uh, some alternative definitions of the control group there, because at least you've you've got other professional sporting events going on in in those control cities. And if there is some sort of you know, we have talked about and, and sort of worried about uh, substitution within uh, sports, and there is some evidence that 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 happens, uh, and and that would if that goes on, this again might might. Uh, make our uh, identification a little less sharp. That, that's a good idea. That's a, that's the certainly reasonable uh, alternative control group. Yeah, like that. And then Zach also asked, what year from new team entrant does the increase in mortality seem to peak from the events that he figures it doesn't seem to happen in the first few years post entrant? Uh, yeah, those event study uh, those event study models don't control, don't contain very many. It's really only the fixed effects in there. It doesn't contain time varying. Um, and we haven't carried that out to, to much farther. Under the, under the, the sort of most liberal definition of our treatment, it doesn't matter because you flip the switch on, games start taking place. It doesn't matter how long the games have been going on there. Every flu season is different. And, uh, and if anything, it should be sooner because Dennis and I, we know that there's novelty effect of attendance. And then in a lot of these sports, attendance is much higher in the first four or five seasons. A new team comes in or a new facility gets built uh, than later. Um, but yeah, we, again, uh, I think one could model the dynamics on this if you wanted to specify a full distributed lag model. And 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 try to get at that. That's just not the the approach that we want to take right now. Although I'm, I'm not saying that somebody shouldn't do that in the future, and it's not a bad idea. Okay. And then Julio uh, Fontino uh, asks, maybe a latent class model could be used in order to get different treatment effects for different groups. A group of cities could be formed by climate, wealth, or similar things. Sure. Sure. I don't. Uh, it's it's extremely likely that there's heterogeneous treatment effects, and I don't, uh, I don't dispute that. Um, uh, and that might again provide more useful information for the people who are trying to decide how we should reopen and when we should let fans back into these these games and matches that are going to be played. Uh, and those those models are, you know, once we have the data, we can certainly uh, can certainly think about estimating those models pretty easily. So yeah, that's a good point as well. I, Hmm. Okay, well, that's basically all the questions that I've had and kept track of in the chat. Um, so if, if folk do want to unmute their mics and ask any questions or comments. Somebody's got a, somebody's got their hand up, Ian. Hi. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, uh, this is my first time doing this. So uh, thanks very much uh, for yeah putting this on, and uh, yeah, really nice talk. Uh, I was just wondering. So you mentioned about who is uh, dying potentially. It's you had some tentative evidence to say that it was more pronounced amongst the over 65s. Uh, so I was wondering whether there was a big difference between the people attending your games and those who were dying. So do you know who's dying by gender? No, no, we just in this in this particular data set, it, it has its strengths and its limitations. And one of the limitations is there for the all cause mortality data, we just have it by age bins and we don't have it in any more detail than that. So unfortunately, uh, that's the that's the best sort of robustness check we can do, given these data. Now, there are other data sources we could we have thought about. It's just a large data collection job. But you can, in the United States, get access to the actual micro level um, death certificate data, which would list also, you know, age, race, gender, uh, all sorts of things like that, and cause of death, and, uh, and and tease that out and understand this better. And I think that ultimately, to pin down the mechanism, we're going to need to do that. But uh, you know, given our data availability, that's that's the best we can do. Right, thanks. Any more questions, comments? And feel free to use the the new hand raised option in Teams if you want to. 
Well, thanks very much, everybody. There's some great comments and, and questions, and I think that's uh, really, it's great to get feedback on this uh, at this point, and, uh, and, and I really thank everybody for those comments. And thank you, Brad, uh, Jane, uh, co-authors, um, for uh, presenting, carrying out the work uh, and presenting it in this forum. It's obviously uh, very timely work, important work. You know, I think we're, it's perhaps something we've been had the luxury of not thinking too much about uh, over the years, but now it becomes an increasingly important from a public health perspective to think about all these things that we normally do uh, and the potential impacts of them. So thank you very much, Brad. Um, we're going to be back again uh, next week, uh, and David Ong will present a paper uh, on the college admissions contribution to the labour market beauty premium. So I look forward to seeing you all again next week uh, and have a good rest of the day and good weekend. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks, James. Thanks, Brad.